Bill McGuire is a professor emeritus of geophysical and climate hazards at University College London, a co-director of the New Weather Institute, and was a contributor to the 2012 IPCC report on climate change and extreme events. His books include A Guide to the End of the World, Everything You Never Wanted to Know, and Waking the Giant, How a Changing Climate Triggers Earthquakes, Tsunamis, and Volcanoes. In his latest book, Hot House Earth, an inhabitant's guide, which I have right here, Professor McGuire explains the science behind the climate crisis and presents an honest picture of the world we're going to leave to our kids and grandkids. Professor McGuire, welcome to Eurotrash. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I have to admit that your book was a difficult read, uh, not because of the writing style you employ or anything, actually quite the opposite. Uh, you deliver this Mm, sobering reality check in a very factual, unsentimental way for every phenomenon associated with climate change, whether it's collapsing ice sheets, rising sea levels, extreme weather events, drought, wildfires, etc. You provide an example of what that means from the Earth's past, as well as what our proje uh, current projections for the future tell us. Um, and the picture is not pretty. So at the end, I did feel slightly depressed, which you admit in the book is kind of a normal response to all this. But let's touch on, on that later on, because first we have to have a word about terminology. At the beginning of the book, you write that the often used term global warming has a cozy feel to it, that it's far, uh, that is far um, from justified by the reality. You propose alternative terms, global heating and climate breakdown instead. Why is the language important? Well, that, that's not just my suggestion. People have been using global heating and climate breakdown for a few years now. Uh, and it's really because of what you said there. Warming means, well, things might be, temperatures might be slightly higher, but we can cope with that. Um, in fact, a lot of people, especially living in the UK or Northern Europe, will say, oh, a few more degrees, that's lovely. We won't, won't mind that at all. So it gives the wrong impression. Uh, the impression we, we should be getting is that shown by the massive heat waves and wildfires that we've seen right across the planet in the last two years. And global heating fits with that far better. And the problem with climate change is a change can go either way. Now, you could your climate could become nicer and more stable or it could go the other way. And it's you know, it clearly it's going the other way. It's breaking down. It's becoming more erratic. It's become, becoming more dangerous. So those two terms fit perfectly. And I'd really like to see warming and change go out the window. During the famed Paris Climate Accords, I believe that was eight years ago already, uh, we promised to limit the global average temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius, right? Which you say in the book is practically impossible. You write that even if long-term goals promised at COP26 last year, I believe that was in Glasgow, that if these were met, the rise would still be at least two degrees Celsius. Now, when most of us hear that, you touched on it already, um, but with, when most of us hear that, we kind of think, oh, that's not too bad. What's all the fuss about? You know, For example, if I go out for a walk in 15 degree weather and it suddenly rises to 17 degrees, I probably won't even notice it, right? So could you please explain why a rise of the global average temperature for two degrees Celsius isn't innocent at all? And why would it, what would it actually mean for our planet? Well, the key word there is average, isn't it? I mean, that, that two degrees doesn't, as you say, sound like very much. It sounds quite nice, in fact, if you're in a cold country. But I'm in, I'm in Berlin, so I <laughs> right, and in the UK here as well. But the um, you know, you average, you you take a look at what the temperatures are doing across the planet. Uh, the oceans are warming up more slowly than the land, so land temperatures are already above one and a half degrees C temperature rise since pre-industrial times. But the critical area is the poles. At the poles, warming or heating, I should say, is occurring four to five times more more rapidly than the global average. And of course, the poles are where all the ice is. So we lose that ice, we see big changes in sea level. We also change the, the reflectivity, the albedo of the Earth. So the Earth absorbs more heat instead of uh, allowing more to be reflected out into space. So you know, that is the worst possible news for us. So that little temperature rise, people must recognize that that's an average and it, it's not the same everywhere by any means. 
So which other places would be affected the worst? I read uh, recently that Europe is heating up twice as fast as the rest of the planet. Is that true? Um, most, well, the, there's a lot of dis discussion about this because people who still think that climate breakdown isn't happening say, hang on, there have been reports saying the United States is heating up twice as quickly, Europe's heating up twice as quickly, and lots of other places are. How can that be? Well, the reason is that the oceans are heating up far more slowly because they they need to absorb a massive amount of heat for the temperature to rise even a tiny little bit. So, yes, Europe is warming at twice the average rate. So are many other landmass areas on the planet. And that's luckily for us due to the oceans. Besides the rise of the global temper, um, average temperatures, there's also something called the tipping points in the climate system, right? And of course, the chance of crossing any of these rises along with the temperatures. Some of the tipping points are the Amazon forest die off, the Greenland ice sheet disintegration, the permafrost thaw, and unfortunately, the list goes on and on. And I think there's about like 15 or 16 of them. The really scary part is that once breached, they are irreversible. And if I understood it correctly, they can produce a domino effect, um, triggering the rest of them. Which one of these are you currently worried about the most? Where are we closest right now? Well, there's a, there's a few tipping points, which look as they'll probably tip at one and a half degrees global average temperature rise, or even slightly below that. So, you know, they, they could have tipped already. We will only know after the event. And those include the collapse of the Greenland ice sheet, which would ultimately result in a seven metre sea level rise. Collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is another five metres. Um, rapid thawing of, of high altitude, high latitude permafrost and a, a, a shutdown or dramatic slowdown of the Gulf Stream and associated currents. They can all occur round about now or maybe just a few points of one degree centigrade higher. So they're all big, big concerns at the moment. Okay, but collapse has that immediate ring to it, right? Like, when would we realize that this has happened? It probably wouldn't be like that movie, The Day After Tomorrow, <laughs> when a sudden ice change arrives. I think you mentioned that one in the book as well, right? Yeah, The Day After Tomorrow. It starts off very well, rooted in science, but then it goes completely off the rails after the first <laughs> half an hour of the film. No, it wouldn't be like that, but... But increasingly, it looks as if sea level is going to be rising much faster than originally thought in the IPCC reports. A number of papers now have suggested we could see two metres by the end of the century, which is only 80 years away, less than that. Um, and that fits with observations of how quickly the ice is melting and how quickly the melt is accelerating and also how quickly sea, level, sea levels are actually going up. They're now going up half a centimetre a year. Whereas about 30 years ago, it was a few millimetres. So it could be doubling every 20 years. So the collapse won't be overnight of either of these ice sheets, but it will be increasingly rapid over the next uh, in coming decades and in the next century. Why are these projections um, worsening every year? Um, it seems that, you know, the projections were much better only a couple of years ago. And now they're suddenly like much worse, double of what they were for a lot of these um, parameters. Well, there's a, quite a simple reason for that. It, and that's the, the IPCC reports are conservative because they have representatives of every country on the planet looking at every sentence, objecting to certain sentences, toning down this, that and the other, United States, Saudi Arabia, Russia, whoever you like. So it's inevitably going to be conservative. And it's also a consensus based report. It tends to ignore or play down things like tipping points and their impacts because they say there wasn't enough information or there isn't enough information. So that's why. Uh, and it's been shown actually by research that climate scientists as a group tend to play down um, the worst uh, uh, factors in terms of you know, looking ahead. If they say this is going to happen uh, by a certain date, it happens soon. Or if they say this is going to happen um, uh, and it's going to be bad, it ends up being even worse. So that, you know, it, there is a lot of underplaying and has been a lot of underplaying of the threat going back many decades. Okay, as we speak, uh, COP27 or the United Nations Climate Change Conference is happening in Sharm el-Sheikh uh, right now. And there's already been worrying reports about climate activists being detained while oil and gas lobbyists number in the hundreds and are treated like royalty. No surprises there. How is it 
looking to you so far and what would you, what would need to happen so we could say that actual progress was being made well it's i don't expect anything of cop 27 i was at glasgow last year okay that's gloomy <laughs> i know right. i didn't expect anything okay, I, honestly <laughs> i didn't expect anything in glasgow either and i didn't get anything promises and pledges but nothing concrete and that seems to be all that comes out of these events so far at cop 27 there hasn't been a huge amount to shout about some of the the uh, heavily forested country countries like brazil and the Congo and Indonesia have come together to form an alliance to uh, look at stopping and or at least rowing back on deforestation, but the, you know, the, there are no commitments there at all. Um, other things that have come out of it are that people are still talking about one and a half degree C global average temperature rise as something that's attainable, um, despite the fact that for that to happen, we need emissions to fall by 45% in about 85 months by 2030. I can't see any practical way that could possibly happen, but people are still going on about it. And what this does, it allows world leaders and oil companies to say, don't worry, there's plenty of time yet. We can still keep under one and a half degrees. And that just gives them an excuse, a fig leaf, if you like, to carry on pumping out um, fossil fuels or doing nothing to cut emissions. So you know, it's pretty gloomy so far. Okay, but what would need to happen um, for you to say that um, actual progress was made at the conference. What what sort of pledges or mechanisms would would have to be in place or agreed upon? Well, I I I'd want to see mechanisms which showed uh, that if they if if the pledges that were agreed at COP twenty seven actually happened, emissions would fall by at least forty five percent in seven and a bit years. They have to do that now. There's no more. You know, well, well, when I say there's no more time left, I don't think there's any time left now. Um, but that's that's all that would do it. And one way of doing that would be to keep all fossil fuels in the ground. In other words, cutting subsidies globally to fossil fuel companies, which are in the trillions every year, uh, stopping insurance companies insuring the facilities, stopping banks lending and uh, having a big tax at the wellhead and the mine entrance, uh, it, just to keep the carbon where it is. Because without that, I don't see how we can make much progress at all. But then again, I don't see that happening either. Can you walk us through what is going to happen if we continue to do business as usual, as it looks like right now in the upcoming decades? Well, I suppose the thing that's hitting home most is not the slow ramp, ramping up of the global average temperature. It's the extreme weather that is caused by our, our stable climate starting to break down. And that's going to become much, much more obvious in the decades ahead. And not only the, the direct physical impacts, but what I call the threat multiplier effects on things that we already have, things like war, civil unrest, famine, health, etc. It's the impact of climate breakdown on those that's going to become massively important in the decades ahead. And in the book, I just highlight one statistic from the uh, Chatham House uh, Policy Institute in the UK, which was published last year, and that is that by 2050, the world will need 50% more food. But crop yields could be down by as much as 30%. Now that translates into a halving of food for everyone on the planet on average. Obviously, it won't work out like that because a majority of world countries will suffer far more. But nobody will be immune to such a massive reduction in food. There will be you know, widespread famine, civil strife, war in the, in the developed countries as well as people just scrabble to get enough food to eat. That's 28 years away. Oof. And we're already having a taste of that these days, yep. to be honest, right? Yeah. I mean, wildfires in Europe, um, crazy temperatures. We talked about the interview uh, briefly, and I'm in Germany right now, and I've, be, I've I've been living here for 10 years, and I can't remember when November was um, this warm. Never. I mean, it's it's in Slovenia, where I'm originally from, I think we re recorded the warmest November ever since we began recording of 26 degrees um, um, recently. So, um, yeah, it's it feels like we're somehow already there. It used to feel just a decade ago that uh, we still have kind of loads of time. And but now it just feels like even to an average person that the time is just gone. Yeah, well, the last, I mean, in just the last three or four years, extreme weather has absolutely exploded right across the planet. 
because even if you go back five years, as you say, it, you know, we had unusual weather, but it was nothing like it is at the moment. I mean, every year now you can expect European temperatures, summer temperatures to be 45 degrees or even considerably higher. In the UK now, we shot up to four, over 40 degrees this summer. Nothing like that's ever happened here before. And the same right across the planet, Canada, North America, um, South America, Australia, everywhere is seeing this. And unless you're a complete idiot, you cannot avoid seeing what's happening around you. Just People just need to look around them and, they re and realize that this is a different world from the world that their grandparents lived in. Well, it seems like there's a couple of these still lurking around. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, as most of our uh, listeners probably know by now, among other things, I'm an incorrigible hypochondriac. So the chapter in your book about the effects of climate breakdown on human health kind of rattled me the most, to be honest. Also, because I honestly thought that at least in this department, hotter and wetter weather might actually be, you know, at least neutral for our well-being. It turns out that's not the case. Could you explain why? Well, hotter and weather, hotter and uh, wetter weather is perfect for mosquitoes, for example, <laughs> and lots of other great, <laughs> lots of other nasty tropical diseases, which are already getting into Europe. Um, things like dengue fever and West Nile uh, virus, all these sorts of things are spreading out of their original um, locations because uh, they're finding places where they can survive over the winter and therefore they can breed and they can build colonies there. I mean, it's only only after the war was malaria um, got rid of in the UK. And I think it was in the 1970s in Italy. So it's not that long ago and it won't be long till these diseases are all working their way back up there again. Um, this question might be more appropriate for a psychologist, but you've been in this sphere for a long time and at the highest levels as well. When it comes to solutions, why do you think it's easier for us to resort to magical thinking, um, you know, rather than stop what we're doing? When I have conversations with people, I hear the argument about human ingenuity a lot, you know, and it seems that the closer to the brink we come, the more people cling onto some, some type of a cheap Hollywood scenario where a genius scientist or a billionaire even appears with an out-of-the-box idea and pulls us away from the precipice, of course, at the very last second. Why is it so hard for us to admit that we have to change and we have to change now? Well, people don't want to give up their lifestyles in the developed countries, certainly, and they, uh, they still think that tomorrow is going to be the same as today. They don't have, they can't imagine uh, what sort of future we'd be facing with the real severe climate breakdown. They, so they cling to the, they cling to the past, if you like. Um, and the whole idea that the, you're talking about geoengineering is, is the broad term, is a massive distraction from reducing emissions. Because if world leaders think, oh, there's a techno fix sitting in the background that we can use, then they're not going to bother too much about reducing emissions. So the very possibility that we can use technology to, well, they call it a solution to the climate breakdown, but in fact, it's just tackling the symptoms. But the very possible existence of that is a real problem. In practical terms, what do you think, um, how would we switch to, uh, or how would we cut emissions right now? Well, what needs to happen and what do we need to do, like starting today? Like... Well, as I said earlier, that we, when, once carbon has got out of the ground and into, the, into society and the economy, it's incredibly difficult to, to keep track of and, and to reduce. The best way to do it is by stopping carbon coming out of the ground. So, you know, you only have a limited number of wellheads where oil and gas comes out and mine entrances where coal comes out. If you target those, then you can have a huge and rapid transition very, very quickly. And uh, that's got to be the answer, I think. That's something that could be done today if the will was there. Obviously, fossil fuel companies are going to be objecting to this, understandably from their point of view. And uh, world leaders don't want to do it. I mean, there was an announcement today from India that they, they, they the biggest investment in coal in the country's history. They want to dig out so much coal that, uh, that not only have they got as much as they need, but they want to export as well. That's insanity, Oof, frankly. Okay. Considering India is going to be absolutely hammered by climate breakdown, that is just insane. 
Yeah, was, wasn't there reports of birds fly, fly, excuse me, birds um, falling from the sky because of extreme heat only this summer in India? Yeah, 54, yeah. 55 degrees. And, and India and China are going to be susceptible to, to in the future to what are called humid heat waves, where the combination of humidity and heat stops the human body from, from sweating. Uh, it can't lose heat. The, it, ultimately, within six hours, organ failure results in death. And there's nothing that can be done unless air, air conditioning is available. So for agricultural workers in India and China, you could see millions dying in a day in the second half of this century, if not before. But it seems that the government just couldn't care less about its own people. Oof, dreadful. Um, even if we stop pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere right now, we're still going to be warming up for a while, right? This is how it works. Well, There's uh, so much gases in the atmosphere right now that it would take decades for 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 Earth to start cooling down again. Well, it's it's slightly. Yeah, I understand that correctly. It, it's slightly different. I mean, unless there's, okay. and if you discount tipping points, which you can't really, but if you forget about those for the moment, if we cut all emissions today down to zero, then you might get a little bit of heating for uh, maybe a, a decade or two, but essentially it would stop. But it wouldn't go down. That's the problem. The the peak temperature that we're reaching here will stay like that for many decades, maybe centuries. So we're locking the, as the temperature, global average temperature goes up and up and up, we're locking that temperature in for a very long time, unless you use technology to suck the carbon out. And and what's happening with that? Are we there yet? Well, this is, this is, this is the whole thing with geoengineering. There are things you can, that have been demonstrated on a small scale, but rolling them out at a global scale would be as difficult as cutting emissions globally. That's the thing. I mean, there's a a plant in Iceland that was opened last year, a power plant that will suck 4,000 tonnes of carbon out of the atmosphere every year. But just to cope with a year's worth of admit, uh, emissions, you would need 10 million of those plants around the world. Now, think how much energy, resources, water, power, etc., are needed to build those. And this is the same with all geoengineering schemes, pretty much. You scale them up and they become incredibly difficult and expensive to do. Lately, there's been a lot of talk about the advances in nuclear fusion. So <laughs> trying to replicate, I think, especially from the UK, right? So trying to replicate, OK, yeah. I see we've gotten a reaction already. <laughs> uh, so basically trying to replicate the reaction that, that powers the sun. Do you put, OK, I'm rhetorical question but by this point but do you put any stock into this as one of the possible solutions well in the future it would be very nice but it's 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 nowhere near being uh, workable so it can't do anything to address the, the critical situation we're in now and the other thing is ever since i've been about five years old fusion has been 40 years in the future it's been 40 years in the future all through my life and uh, i know people now claim it's nearer than that but i'll believe it when i see it <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, so before... Oh, no, I wanted to talk about this. Um, bad news is not over. In the book, you talk about known unknowns, or is it the other way around? <laughs> Which is a term that was used quite unfortunately by the former secretary. <clears throat> what was he again? Donald Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld yeah. right? Defense, yeah. defense secretary of yeah. the US. When he tried um, very hard to um, mask the fact that they knew that there was no, um, what, what's it called, nuclear weapons. Weapons of mass Iraq. destruction, yeah. That was it. The, uh, weapons of mass destruction, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Um, can you talk about the known unknowns um, as far as climate change is concerned? Yeah, well, I mean, one of them, which is the, is the one that my research focuses on, is how uh, climate, a changing climate actually affects the solid earth, which people... Even climate scientists had no idea about until until I contributed to the, the 2012 IPCC report. Um, and it sounds mad to lots of people today, but it's it's a big issue where you where you have particularly very thick ice sheets. Those ice sheets tend to stop active faults in the Earth's crust from moving due to the weight of the ice. But as that ice is removed, the load on those faults is removed and they can they can rupture to generate earthquakes. Now, because they probably won't have done ruptured at all for thousands of years, they tend to generate massive quakes. And we saw this at the end of the last ice age in Scandinavia, 
a huge ice sheet which melted uh, and allowed the forts underneath to rupture, which had accumulated strain for 80,000 years or so. So we had magnitude eight earthquakes in Lapland, which is astonishing. It's the sort of things you expect to get around the, the Pacific Rim. Uh, the, the, the worrying thing is though, that one of these earthquakes triggered one of the world's biggest submarine landslides, uh, which sent a tsunami across into the UK, Norway, right across the Atlantic, down into the North Sea with uh, heights of 20 meters or so. Um, and the worry today is that Greenland is in exactly the same position as Scandinavia was 20,000 years ago. The whole of the North Atlantic now is bouncing back up again as the ice melts. Any force under Greenland could start to, to um, generate earthquakes within decades. And those in, in turn have the potential to trigger submarine landslides due to the shaking. And we may therefore have a tsunami risk in the North Atlantic. But that's something that most people would never have thought of in terms of climate breakdown. But it's one of the uh, one of the known unknowns. Well, it's known to some people, but not to many. So a hypothetical tsunami would come our way in Europe, or can it go anywhere? Or well, it would. I how mean, does that work? The, the the slide off the coast of Norway, which happened at the end of the last ice age, went yeah. westward and southward. It spread out from a point across the whole of the North Atlantic. The run-ups, the height of the waves in northern Scotland were 20 metres. So, you know, it went, the Shetland Isles, the wave just went straight across. Um, there was no obstacle for them. And there was an area of land which was inhabited in the North Sea called Doggerland at the time. That was wiped out by these waves. So there is a potential um, for... Uh, I, well, I have a number of German colleagues that have worked on this, and they call call for a, a seismic response in the Greenland area within possibly within decades. So, you know, we could start to see earthquake activity starting to pop up there, which is a bit worrying. Oh, great. <laughs> great news. Um, OK, um, how do you what do you say to so-called climate change skeptics when they say, oh, you know, the earth is always doing its thing. The climate's going to change. It's all kind of natural. We've seen it before in the Earth's past, and of course, we're seeing it again. And that the human, you know, the human contribution is negligible. Well, um, are you tired of these conversations, or are they still worth having? I don't have. Well, what I normally say is, you're not a skeptic because a skeptic has looked at all the evidence and come to a different conclusion. The evidence for anthropogenic, for human caused climate breakdown, is overwhelming. Um, so you can't be skeptical of it. You're a denier. That's the first thing I'd say. And they are deniers. Um, a lot of it's ideological. They, they tend to be right wing libertarian people who, who you know, they, everything is the free market. They don't want anything that can affect that. So climate breakdown affects their worldview and therefore they're just going to ignore it, pretend it's not happening. So I reckon a lot of them in the back of their minds know this is real, but they just won't admit it. Before our listeners accuse us of pure fear mongering, what can we as individuals do right now to make our contribution, you know, in stopping climate's breakdown? Yeah, well, in terms of fear mongering, one thing I should say, first of all, is everything in, in Hot House Earth is based on peer reviewed research and observation. So there's nothing there at all uh, of my personal opinion. It's just published work. But in terms of what we should do, I think everybody by now knows about the obvious things, not flying using public transport as, mu as much as possible, um, go uh, by switching to a green energy energy tariff, all these sorts of things, not eating as much meat, no meat if possible. Um, but I, I know lots of people that do this and they've said to me, you know, I still don't feel as if I'm doing anything and I'm getting quite depressed. And I tell them, join an activist organization. Jo in, right. you know, just stop oil, extinction rebellion, insulate Britain or whatever you would have in Germany or other countries, because First of all, it means you're actively doing something hands on, but also it will make you feel better. You will feel much more positive because you're getting involved in it. And I tell people, you know, you don't have to stick yourself to roads or buildings or, or do anything like that. There are lots of backroom roles that uh, these organizations uh, need uh, and, and it will be great all around. It'd be great for the organizations and it will make you feel much better. And it seems to work. It is slightly Excuse me? It seems to work. People I've talked to have joined up say, so, yeah, it does okay. work. I, I feel That's a lot a happier. Tip. Just being with other people, yeah. like-minded people, makes a big difference.
Right, right. Because it seems to me that the solutions narrative that's being pushed in the media right now, like you said, is focused on this kind of non-political, individualistic, tweak your habits approach, you know, just sort out your garbage and we'll be just fine in the end. On the other hand, I've just read an, a, an article on CNN citing a study that said that billionaires emit a million times more greenhouse gases than the average person. Yeah. Um, you know, so it makes you think I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. And then we have some idiot on his pi private plane just polluting like a million more versions of me. How is that right? I mean, why are we doing this from the bottom up and not the other way around? Well, I, I completely agree. And I mentioned in the book the, the something about the, the carbon footprints of billionaires. And, and now, of course, they, they can ship themselves off into space just to make their footprint that much bigger. Um, so it's <laughs> it's ridiculous. And it's also ridiculous. I mean, I think just a few days ago, one of the heads of one of the oil companies was saying, oh, it's not our fault. Um, people should stop using all this stuff made from fossil fuels. So you know, it's, not, it's nothing to do with them, apparently. <laughs> it's all our fault. So yeah, you're right. It has to come from the. It has to come from governments, corporations, um, and yeah, billionaires as well. Which, in my opinion, we shouldn't have any of. It's slightly worrisome that even people who have young kids just don't seem to be that interested in you know changing or, like you said, joining an activist group. Um, we're all just kind of waiting for something really bad to happen um, and and i don't know I, and and you describe in the book as well that it's starting to, that climate breakdown itself is starting to have an impact on mental health mm, yeah. um could, could you could you talk about that a little bit as well yes i mean so? there's it's well there are a number of areas in, in wherein this is happening i mean partly people who do understand climate change and do know what it's going to bring are you know not surprisingly, you're getting more depressed about it and worried. So it's affecting many people's mental health in that sort of way. But also, when you have uh, increasing, num increasing amounts of extreme weather, um, particularly in majority world countries, um, now that affects people's mental health hugely. If you've got a home, if you've been shifted 200 miles away from where you live because of drought, um, there's things that are going on at the moment in, in East Africa, for, for example, the famine and drought, all these sorts of things contribute to a massive increase in mental health across the planet. So inevitably, that's going to get worse and worse as time goes on. As a bit of an Eastern European commie, I simply have to ask you this. Um, the famous Brazilian envir environmentalist Chico Mendes, who was fighting to preserve the Amazon rainforest and was also killed because of his activities, once famously said that ecology without class struggle is just gardening. Do you think that it is even possible to solve this problem within the system that created it in the first place? No, I don't think capitalism can solve the climate emergency. It's a system based on greed, short-term profit and exploitation. How, how the hell is that going to solve the problems that we have at the moment? We need a system that works for the, for the greater good. Otherwise, and, and it doesn't rate the planet. Otherwise, I can't see how we can, we'll, we'll manage to do this. Could you offer us a bit of a glimpse in the background? Because you were a contributor to the 2012 IPCC report on climate change and extreme events. How does that look like um, working not just with scientists, but also with politicians and probably lobbyists as well? Well, that was a special report, not one of the, the not one of the six year um, summaries that they do. It was a special report looking at extreme weather and the impact of emissions on that, which is why I contributed a part on how the climate and the solid earth would interact. Um, but you know, everything that was in that report has pretty much come to pass uh, and much earlier than expected. I think the problem is that governments and most people don't still don't get it they still don't understand how bad climate breakdown is set to be and if you're not you know if you don't know that if you don't appreciate that then it's never going to be of any great interest to you if you tell your tell somebody your children are going to have to fight to survive then they might start thinking about it a little bit more in a little bit more detail um, so when we wrote that report um, 
we talked about various extreme events that could happen. Those things are happening now already, and they're going to get a hell of a lot worse. Do you think we're finally going to start waking up when, I don't know, the offspring of the elites is going to be going to get affected or their livelihoods are going to get affected? Because it seems like until that happens, we're just going to hear more of empty promises, more of the same. And is it a real concern that when we finally wake up, it's too late already? Well, that's what I've always thought, to be honest. I've, I've always thought that serious action won't be taken until nobody can ignore how bad things are getting. And we'll then have the worst of both worlds because we'll still have to slash emissions even faster just to stop dangerous becoming cataclysmic. And that will mean that we'll, you know, we might have things like personal carbon limits, uh, big restrictions on our the various freedoms in our lives um, at the same time as you know, we're being hammered by extreme weather left, right and centre. So I think the way you know, my view has always been that we're not going to really respond until things are bad. So we, that's probably going to be in a few years' time, the way things are going. Oof. A few years' time? Well, look at the last three years in terms of extreme weather. Um, another, three okay. year, another three years of that, and, and there can't be many people that don't, you know, don't pick up and pay attention, but who knows? Yeah. I think we're still kind of thinking, oh, it's a fluke. You know, uh, the brain just reverts back to this kind of uh, interpretation. Oh, it's been really bad this year. So next year, it's going to be a bit more mild. Yeah, well, you know? in the UK. Uh, everything. Yeah. <laughs> so we cover the truth yeah. from ourselves a little bit. Well, in the, in the UK, when, you know, temperatures are 38, then they got up to 40 degrees. You still had some idiots saying, oh, I remember the summer of 1976. That was really warm. Yes, it was. But it wasn't anywhere near like this. And the only reason you remember 1976 is because that stuck out like a sore thumb, whereas every summer is like that or hotter now. now. Hot summers now are not anything to talk right home about, are they? They just happen every year. Yeah, didn't uh, the illustrious previous American president um, say that, oh, it's really cold during this winter, so climate change is obviously not a real problem? Yes, well, less said about that, the better, I think. <laughs> <laughs> When, you, when you've only got two brain cells, you know, you can't really come up with much sales, much sales can you? <laughs> All right. Um, the name of this podcast is Eurotrash, which means I also have to ask you something a bit more silly. Out of all the so-called geoengineering ideas you've ever heard, which one was the wackiest? Um, oh, let me think. Didn't Bill Gates want to <laughs> shoot something into the atmosphere or something along those lines? Oh, been, was, you uh, described that in the book. There have been all... Some uh, aerosols or what was it? Oh, well, that's not even that unusual. I mean, one, one of the... All the, oh, right. <laughs> believe it or not, yeah, one of the schemes that is being touted quite strongly is imitating a volcano by pumping lots of sulfur dioxide or similar chemicals into the atmosphere. Um, volcanoes... Is that the Bill Gates idea? Uh, I think that's one of his ideas, but people have been talking about this for, right. for long, a long time right. before. Billionaire here. to the rescue, fantastic. Yeah. But it's Bruce not, Wayne. you know, sim simulated volcanic eruptions, big volcanic eruptions have a massive impact on the weather and the climate. So yeah. a simulated volcano is not safe um, by any means. Okay, but wh what's the what's the reasoning behind it? Could you explain it a little bit? Yeah, well, if we simulate a volcano eruption, what happens to the climate? Well, the gases, if you use sulfur gases, they reflects incoming solar radiation back into space so they will cool the surface but that's doing nothing about carbon dioxide that's just treating a symptom it doesn't bring down carbon dioxide that has to be done as well and if it isn't done as well and you keep blocking the sunlight when you when you eventually for some reason stop doing that the temperature would just shoot up it doesn't do anything about acidification of the oceans or anything like that so you know it's a it's an uh, a, a sticking plaster thing to just to address one symptom rather than anything else and it's risky could any of these geoengineering ideas actually work any of the ones that you heard of what about those uh, I, there was a, a there was an idea about freezing the poles again or something right well it's creating clouds over the poles cooling them down protecting them from sunlight but you don't you know doing these things at massive scale is is just you know, is beyond us and all would be extremely costly and probably environmentally damaging. And they're all experiments. I mean, 
you know, human caused climate change is an experiment. The last thing we want is more experiments messing things up even further. So it's and it also stamps over everybody's human rights. I mean, who well, I don't want them to do that. Do I have any say in, in whether geoengineering happens or not? Who says it can go ahead? Who makes that decision? It's just a, it's a whole can of worms that that we shouldn't be opening if we just slashed emissions as we need to do. So any of these ideas would actually be another known unknown with unforeseeable side effects. Absolutely. Probably, I mean, right? you get people, you will get people who support them saying, oh, we've modeled it and everything's fine. But I, funnily enough, I don't trust them. <laughs> you know, that's just... Fair enough. Everybody's not going to say, oh, all right, then we believe you. Let's do it. I mean, why would you do that? <laughs> At the end, Professor Maguire, could you offer us any sort of glimmer of hope? Wherever you can find it, if you can find it. But let's pretend you can find it. Well, I mean, that you know, it's happening too slowly. But if I look around me here where I live in, in the, the Peak District in, in England, I mean, I my house is powered by biomass. I've got solar panels. Uh, the rest of our electricity comes from a green energy tariff. I drive an electric car. When I go down to the station in a minute to get a train, I'll drive past wind farms. Now, none of that would have been possible 10 years ago. So there is change. Change is happening. Uh, and there has been an, an enormous amount of change. It just needs to be accelerated uh, far, far more so that we can actually tackle the emergency. All right. Um, if I I forgot about this before, um, but I think you mentioned in the book that a really fast way that we could kind of at least buy ourselves some time would be to cut methane. Oh yeah. Uh, emissions, right? Yeah. Um, how would that work, and and why would that be kind of easier or something that we could do relatively quickly? Well, methane is eighty six times more effective at warming the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. But it stays in the atmosphere for only about 20 years or so. It doesn't hang around as long as carbon dioxide, which stays out there for, for a century. So if we can dramatically cut methane emissions from agriculture, from uh, flaring of gas at gas installations, this sort of thing, it could make a very big difference in, in, in the short term. And then maybe pull, it, pull the temperature down by half a degree or so, or reduce the rate of climate of the temperature by that much. Um, now, at COP26 in Glasgow last year, and a lot of countries came together and said, we're going to cut emissions by 30%, methane emissions by 30%. But there's no monitoring of that. There's no legal framework. Um, and it didn't include the biggest methane producers. <laughs> so it, you know, it isn't really that good. But methane is still there as a, a, a low hanging fruit, as it's called, something that can be tackled very quickly. So, you know, there should be focus on that. And and how would we slash methane? Which industries use it the most? How would we just like curb it immediately? Well, oil, we have... oil and gas. So, I mean, you know, oil oil wells will flare off. They'll burn any methane that comes out and just burn it so it enters the atmosphere, which is you know, not what we want to see. So, oil and gas installations uh, need to take the need to take the most action, uh, and agriculture as well. I mean, the more we move away from mass production of, of meat particularly cows, then the, the lower methane levels from agriculture will be. They're farting. Exactly. I, into the I was being like polite. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not. Um, all yeah. right. Um, so actually eating less meat would also be kind of viable on an individual level. Yeah. Well, I mean, at a global scale, though, cutting way back on meat would of be course. fantastic because you could reforest those areas um, and get a sort of win-win situation. Right. At the beginning of our conversation, we mentioned climate doomerism, as it's called, the feeling of utter hopelessness that we can feel when trying to digest the gravity of the state we're in. You know, kind of saying to ourselves, pardon my French, I just said that I'm not polite. Like, if it's that bad, fuck it. Let's just watch it all burn. Let's see what happens if we, you know, keep business as usual. What's your remedy against this attitude? Well, I mean... For anybody who has kids, that would be an insane attitude for a start, um, obviously, because they would like the world to be something um, that their, their children would be able to survive in. Uh, but you know, there, there's always hope. This is a point. I mean, every point one degree C is important. So even if ultimately we don't keep the global average temperature below 1.5, maybe we can stop it at 1.6. 
or 1.7. Either of those are better than two, two and a half or 2.8, which is what we're on track for at the moment. So there's always hope and there's always a need to act. And in fact, the more the temperature goes up, the more urgent it is that we act. So you know, I would suggest to people to focus their um, efforts on activism rather than on sitting in a bar and drinking a whole bottle of whiskey or whatever. Oh, damn, because that was my plan for this weekend. <laughs> so, um, but thank you, honestly, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. This, is a, this, was, this was an extremely necessary conversation. I um, urge everybody to read this book. Uh, again, Hothouse Earth, An Inhabitant's Guide. Where can people get your book, Professor McGuire? You can, well, you can buy it in all good bookshops or all online bookshops. It's very easy to find. So, uh, yeah, it shouldn't be difficult anywhere on the planet, I think, at the moment. All right. Um, do you have any social media that people can follow? Yes, um, on Twitter mainly, at Prof Bill Maguire. You can follow me at. Perfect. Again, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I hope we do this again in the future. And this time, I mean, next time with a bit better news than this time. But <laughs> yes. Fingers crossed. All right. That would be great. Thank you again. You're thank very you so welcome. Bye bye.